Um, thank you very much again, um, Yevgeny and Salvatore for organizing this session and, and for the two previous speakers who for their really helpful presentations. Um, I'm just going to quickly, um, my, my, my presentation has been mentioned is looking really at military planning for climate breakdown. Um, but just to quickly introduce myself, I'm, I'm, I'm not working myself as an academic in political ecology. I work for, I'm based here in California, um, but I work for a, a transnational institute, which is a research institute based in the Netherlands, uh, which has been working closely with social movements now for about 40 plus years. Um, and, and works with movements such as Via Campesina, Fisher's movements, uh, movements against extraction um, in different parts of the world and has, has a series of programs uh, doing research and also kind of logistical support for a lot of international movements. Um, so I, I come at this from a, a kind of more of an activist background, but one of our aims has always been to kind of bridge academia and activism together. And, and so that's why it's really um, good to be part of this, uh, part of these discussions. Um, uh, what I'm going to present today is is really some of the research that came out of a kind of a similar activist scholar uh, uh, collaboration, uh, which was a book that emerged called The Secure and the Dispossessed. It, it emerged from the time of looking at, um, uh, at out of Cape Copenhagen, really, 2009, the main uh, discussions that were happening there about, and there was a lot of hope there. It was even called Hopenhagen at one point that there would be a big climate deal. And, um, and after that meeting, I was, I was actually working behind the scenes um, with the Bolivian government at the time as a media person. It became really obvious that there wasn't going to be a deli the delivery of a kind of climate action plan that we needed. So um, I, I started to look at what were the plans for actually adapting to climate change if we weren't going to be addressing the issue. Um, and through talking to both security scholars and, and people working in different kind of key areas like water, energy, and food, um, this kind of book emerged where we looked really at the kind of security narratives that were, 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 were emerging as a kind of response um, to a time of climate disruption. Um, so, and one of those, well, this the question is kind of set up to know the answer right now, but one of the interesting Mo interesting things to observe here in the US is that what is the one institution that despite Trump just the other day saying don't worry the world will cool down very shortly what's the one institution that's actually continued to work actively on climate change within the government during the Trump administration as you might imagine it's been the US military um, and uh, I think it's it's important to um, to really see to see why they have kind of continued and why despite the denialism that's rampant within the Republican Party they haven't act, been able to actually stop um, military officials um, working to prepare for a climate change world. Here are two quotes um, j just from last year, one in the um, US intelligence community um, and one by the former Secretary of Defense James Mattis. And both very much saying that climate change um, was something that the, the whole government, but particularly the Pentagon, had to prepare for. Uh, and, and we also um, have had a, a big push, and it's not been rejected um, by people on the Republican side of aisles, um, apart from a few outliers, to make sure that in the National Defense Authorization Act, which kind of approves the military budgets each year, that there are plan that there are plans to um, include climate vulnerability and, and resilience plans within 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 them. And one of those led to a report in 2018 where the Pentagon surveyed about 3,500 military sites, and half of them were reporting um, effects from kind of key things like s extreme weather. And um, what we have seen is a bit of a shift in language. Uh, so to try and um, avoid too much. Um, push back from the denialists, they've started talking about extreme weather rather than climate change in documents, but basically uh, the, the work has continued. And it, and it builds on a, on a whole um, significant timeline. I think the, the first real big report that came out uh, where they started to look at climate change impacts in the military was in 2003. Interestingly, it involved 
uh, someone from the futurist um, scenarios planning team of Shell. So um, was one of the key officials, along with a Pentagon official who first started to develop. So you had the oil and military uh, working on their plans for the um, for climate change, what they envisage as scenarios. But the big report that really got this going, and you'll see this even in films and books and so on, is was Age of Consequences. Um, this was a, a, a very a report which has continued to have a lot of influence um, right up to today. And it looked at scenarios. They kind of did war game in scenarios and it involved think tank officials, defense establishment uh, figures, intelligence figures um, right across the political spectrum. And they basically said, what's going to happen if we have a one degree? What happens if we have a three degree? And what happens if we have like a five degree scenario? Um, and, and they develop these scenarios of what kind of world we could expect to live in and what were the implications for US national security. Um, and then you've seen this filter through into lots of different things, the, the intelligence community in 2008, the, in some of the big defense planning, it's gone right through to the plans by the different um, central commands of US military. Um, and a big influential and kind of, it was really ramped up, particularly under Obama's administration in 2016, he published a memorandum which directed all departments and agencies of the federal government to ensure that climate change impacts are fully considered in the development of national security doctrine, policies and plans. Now that particular memorandum was stopped, but the US government has, the military has been able to continue working on it. So what's, what's the main concern for the military? I think one of the things is we need to be clear is it's not because they've suddenly become um, a kind of military form of Greenpeace or are really concerned about humanitarian impacts in Bangladesh. Um, and their first primary thing is, is actually their capacity to fight. Um, as I mentioned, the military sites were all brought in extreme weather. A lot of, there's 1,774 US military sites around the world and a lot of them are in low lying coastal areas. Uh, so they're already seeing the impacts, they can't ignore it. One of them, for example, in Hampton Roads, Virginia, is, is called the kind of hub of, the biggest hub of international military might in the world, and it faces storm surges um, every single year and flooding. Um, the other thing that they keep finding is that they're also, their dependence on fossil fuel is actually a vulnerability. Um, James Mattis, who was the Secretary of State for Defense, talked about this tether of fuel that really made the military vulnerable. In fact, um, between 2001-2010, more than 50% of the 36,000 casualties that the US military suffered were from were attributable to hostile attacks during full fuel transportation. Because whether it was in Iraq or whether it was in Afghanistan, they found that the best way to attack the military was to attack the convoys of oil that they were dependent on. And of course, it has impact also the heat, increased heat and the issues of water scarcity have issues on troops um, which have been mobilized. So the, these things have led to the military becoming one of the biggest solar adopters. Um, but as the US Navy Secretary, this is the former one said, you know, this is not, this is really one thing is to make us better fighters. But I think it's also important, and, and what I was more interested in the book and what research is actually what their plans were for the futures, um, not so much the military, but what are the implications of their involvement uh, for dealing with climate disruption, whether it's Hurricane Katrina that Maria talked about, or all the securing the access to resources that Christos is, is, is also referring to. And this, because this is where I think their planning has the most implications for analyzing dystopias and eco-apartheid. Um, so um, if you look at if you look at some of their documents, um, they that what you'll see is increase uh, there's there's an assumption that um, basically we're going to move to a very unstable world. Um, here this in the 2003 one it was talks about a kind of disruption and conflict becoming endemic features of life. Uh, there's talks about, there's a real sense of scarcity and sense of des desperation will lead to conflict, um, that tensions will grow and that this will kind of have ricochet of impacts. Um, and what is noticeable is a lot of the assumptions within the military documents. Firstly, that climate change will lead to scarcity. 
Secondly, that any disruptions of systems will inevitably lead to conflict. Um, and of course, the assumption always is that the US military will need to get involved as this will affect US national security. Um, and the language that keeps coming up is one called threat multiplier. Um, and it's an idea basically that, and another one is catalyst for conflict, that climate change will intensify and exacerbate underlying problems. Um, this is actually uh, very recent. This is the US Senate's Democratic Committee on the Climate Crisis, which basically sums up this, um, this analysis that climate change is a threat and now a multiply exacerbating existing challenges of poverty, environmental degradation, political instability, and social tension around the world. Um, and you'll see what it's, and, and, if, and the, as a result, it's going to intensify risks to US security interests and trigger greater demands on US humanitarian aid and assistance. Um, and it also talks about um, some of the results um, that this will have in terms of migration, in terms of state capacity and so on. And of course, as ever, linking it uh, through to breeding grounds for radicalization, which is and linking back to the whole ideas of the war on terror. Now, the US tends to have the most hyperbolic reports and least nuanced ones, but they, the language of threat multiplier has, has kind of filtered through basically into a series of other climate military plans. Uh, the EU main one was in 2008. It's been adopted again in their US, in the European Union security strategy as a whole. The UK has got a similar one. Germany um, also had an important white paper in 2016. What you'll notice is that all these countries are countries in the north um, and not countries in the south who will mainly suffer from climate change. You, you see very few security strategies, at least, um, being developed right now in the global south. And their attempts to kind of make security the frame of the UN have kind of run up against that each time. So, uh, and the question we asked in the book is whose security are we talking about? Um, and that became very much the kind of theme that ran through it. Um, and I think when you look at the military concerns, there are issues that they raise around, as you saw about humanitarian aid, um, that's, that's raised that there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be disasters. What you'll also see underpinning um, the, a lot of the analysis is, is what are the security threats to supply chains, uh, to borders and migrants is often, I'll come back to this shortly, but migrants is often, increased migration is seen as a threat. Maritime choke points, again, related to supply chains. Uh, and they talk about, uh, very specifically, both the UK and the US one talks about the dangers of disasters and extreme weather to critical economic energy and agricultural hubs. And they, they link it always back to the dangers that this will lead to kind of um, radicalization and terrorism. Um, and so it's very much, as you can see, it's about upholding a, a, an order as it is, a political and economic order. That's the nature of security. It secures for those who already have security. Um, and in upholding that order, it quickly turns, um, and this was a real concern in the book, uh, victims into threats. And you see that most of, obviously in how military strategies talk about borders and migrants. Um, it talks about that, that it will create, will have this extreme instability and it will create migration pressures and that, that we will need to develop secure responses to, to control migration. So again, you can see there's a series of assumptions here. First, that climate change will always cause conflict. Secondly, it will lead to migration and thirdly, that this will pose a security threat to rich nations. There's no discussion of how conflicts could be prevented, um, what in state institutions you might need to prevent conflicts, uh, what, what international establishments you need to prevent conflicts, or how migration could actually be safely facilitated because it's increasingly understood that migration is a climate adaptation strategy um, and we need to find ways uh, to facilitate it where, peop where people should have the choice not not to be forced to leave, but where they do choose to leave to be to be able to do so safely. But of course, in this sense, it kind of builds on an ongoing trend. These are some of the budgets, some budget figures I don't have time to go into, but probably running out of time. But for both the EU and the US, um, have uh, you'll see at the bottom the yellow 
left, you can see the, the front text, which is which has kind of gone up five times in the last um, 10 years and will go up another, it projected to go up another five times, front text being the main EU border security agency. And there you can see under both Republican and Democrat institutions, the, the budgets for both ICE and the Customs and Border Patrol. Um, so, so this is very much kind of consolidating a trend and of course these military strategies are reinforcing the idea that we should increase money for for um for border militarization and i think what we also analyzed was really that this this military security response is becoming socialized and becoming hegemonic in many other areas um most obviously there's a crossover between military and police this is a photo from um, Ferguson, uh, where the police, um, through programs such as where they actually can get military equipment um, f free, basically from the federal government, are becoming increasingly militarized and are using, as, as people like Stuart Schrader have analyzed, um, using counterinsurgency actually as one of their main tactics and exporting that. But we also see it in the way that security becomes a dominant frame in things like food, water, energy. We, we hear all the time talk about food security, water security, energy security, um, kind of removing other frames such as, for example, food sovereignty. Um, so it's, it's becoming a kind of hegemonic response, this military, militarized approach. Um, and of course, what it does, it, it elides the actual role of security forces in creating insecurity for people. Uh, whether that's reinforcing the kind of resource extraction that Christos has talked about, um, or just the role simply of the Pentagon, for example, being the single largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Um, and, and this map, which you can see of US military bases, very much shows what the military carbon bootprint is really about. It's about controlling strategic domination of, of key resource zones and key places where capitalism, the kind of maritime uh, channels uh, flow, um, and and out of that kind of analysis really came a whole um, in many of the chapters that were in the book and, and in our ongoing work is really who do we want to trust with the future because I think what we see and this is again it kind of builds on what Christos said a lot of environmentalists uh, right now talk about welcome the military as an ally in the fight against climate change. Uh, there's a kind of an uncritical adaptation because they take climate change seriously, which at a time of climate denialism seems welcome. Um, but one of the inspirations for the book was an uh, activist, Tim De Christopher, who said, you know, as things become unstable, are the institutions that created the crisis, uh, the military and corporations really ones you want to trust to be the ones to make fair and just decisions um, as we deal with a, a, an increasingly unstable world. And we, I think we know from history and from the whole realms of political ecology that these institutions will enforce rather than dismantle eco-apartheid. Um, in this case, I prefer to put my faith uh, with the indigenous people here in Standing Rock standing against the pipeline rather than the military that are trying to make sure the pipeline gets built. Um, I just want to end really with this image. It's actually was done by an Indian artist, Orijit Sen. Um, and it was of course done in response as you'll see to the COVID pandemic. Um, but I think it's message around solidarity and justice um, being um, uh, approaches we want to follow rather than security to avoid the eco is a really is, is a really important one to take home. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to um, Evgeny.